What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the RP Experience. I'm your host, Andrew Regenhardt, with Southwest Florida Real Producers. And today, we're going to be talking with Santiago Ospina, his business, J.O. Always Clean. Um, J.O. Always Clean is one of our valued partners uh, here uh, within Southwest Florida Real Producers. Uh, Santiago, it is great having you on. Thanks for joining us. Andrew, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. Well, for you guys listening, Santiago is originally from Colombia um, and runs his family business, J.O. Always Clean, here in Naples. Um, he enjoys giving back and helping those in need um, in a few ways, uh, fixing up and donating wheelchairs, uh, creating small libraries for children in rural areas of Colombia. And he's focusing on conserving the rainforest um, by a business uh, that he has started that's a blueberry farm. And we're definitely going to dive in those a little bit more in depth here in a little bit. Um, but it's incredible to hear your story um, and how much you give back and you really enjoy it. I can tell you're so passionate about it. So um, you've been giving back not only in Colombia, but also here locally in our community of Naples. So um, welcome on the podcast. We're excited. Thank you, Andrew. It's really a pleasure. So I, obviously we just talked about a lot of cool stuff. Um, you, you know, you were obviously led by example, I would believe that your parents instilled such strong work ethics and always added the value and to give back uh, to those that are in need. Um, what, what motivates you to serve um, like you do? So my parents are definitely my biggest motivators. Uh, I always saw their example, hard workers, just wanting to get out in life. Um, but they were also really easy going with me. So building that discipline to get to the point where I always saw them, that's my biggest motivator, just trying to get to where I believe I should be. I think we've had such amazing opportunities in life that to give anything less than our best is just wasting it. Agreed. I <laughs> Couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself. So so let's talk about some of these things you've been doing. Uh, the first thing is you, you've been fixing up wheelchairs. Can you? What's going on with Operation Wheelchair, huh? So what happened is um, my dad started it. Uh, he, uh, It turned out we got a lot of clients in the nursing homes, in churches, and we just saw a bunch of things getting thrown out for minor scrapes, stuff that was still functioning. And we have the opportunity to go to Columbia quite a bit. And we saw so many people on the streets making makeshift wheelchairs or walkers, crutches. So we were like, you know what? Let's let's fix some of these up. Let's start taking them over. And that was my dad's initiative. He took, I think, over a thousand wheelchairs, crutches. Um, right now, it's really hard to ship. So we haven't really been doing that as much. But we've thankfully been able to help quite a bit of people and I have some funny stories with it too. That's, that's amazing. Where where are you getting these most of these wheelchairs, or or if someone you know has a wheelchair from family or or whatnot, and they were wanting to to help out, like first of all, can they just reach directly out to you, or like kind of how's that process? So, like I said, normally right now we haven't been doing it as much, but before, like we would get people who knew about it. A lot of our clients they realized it. My dad would see that they had some in their garage, and he would tell them, and. Uh, they all keep coming to us and they're like, hey, we got another wheelchair. Are you guys interested? And we're always, yes, of course. Uh, we would also look for used uh, for sale uh, electric wheelchairs and we would take some of those as well. Um, and then at the churches and at the nursing homes, they would just throw them out and they would be like, hey, George, Santi, we got stuff uh, to the side if you guys want it. Oh, that's so cool. So, yeah, it was just a community effort. Yeah. Now that's obviously helping the, the most of the time, the older population that might need that kind of stuff or someone that's injured. Um, but you're also trying to help the younger generation with, uh, some libraries. So can you elaborate on that? So same thing. My, um, uh, my dad and my mom pretty much retired once I took over the business and, um, we started getting this idea. We have a farm really rural and we started seeing a lot of people without education, without access to books. And um, my dad, one day, he was going to throw away some books. And he was like, you know what? Someone deserves the opportunity to read these. And he's a really good woodworker. So he started building these little libraries. And, um, yeah, he's built, like, I think, 17, 18 little libraries. And uh, we talked to schools, get them involved. And they 
uh, stock them, make sure that the books are in inventory, everything. So that's been a, a really cool project, really good feedback from people in the community. And it's nice to see how people walking by running, they'll just stop, start reading a book, start dropping some off. So it's really nice. It's a community, right? And everyone's mm-hmm. helping out. So that's awesome. Now you have a, obviously JL is clean is your main focus here, here in Southwest Florida. Um, but you have a blueberry farm. That's a fully operational business. Can what's going on with that? And, and how much profit are you really taking home from that? <laughs> uh, I think my profit are the blueberries. Yeah. <laughs> the ones go. I get to eat. Um, Honestly, the blueberry started as a school project, as a class project at college. And as I started getting into it, I started looking at the marketing, looking at everything. I was like, you know what? I want to make something that matters. And I started focusing on the environment, something that's always been dear to me. Um, I love nature. I love animals. So pretty much the whole blueberry is focused to conserving the rainforest, uh, reducing our carbon footprint. So we got eco-friendly packaging made out of corn syrup our labels you can plant them and they grow out of seed uh we've got um so many things are that just keep helping and and i want want to be an example for other businesses so Mm -hmm. right now it's not profitable but i'm okay with it because it's not taking from me and the profit is i love the blueberries it's been a learning experience and anything where you learn that's that's profit yeah and and obviously uh, the listeners will know that the profit question was more because <laughs> i already knew that everything went back into the blueberries and into the rainforest and into people in columbia so um it's something that he's putting his time and effort in uh to give back and help out rather than obviously running it like a normal business might would um yep. so it's it's so cool to see that now we touched on everything else. We gotta we gotta dive into JL Always Clean. So so how's that going? Get us up to speed. Obviously, it was a, a family business, and now you're fully oper- you know operating it. So get us up to speed on that. So we started in 2007. Uh, my dad started it. Um, really hard worker. Anyone who has been with us from the start still is always how's George? Where's George? And um, it's been a transition getting from George. Not to Santi or myself, but just to the company. Getting people to realize that Jay Always Clean is the here, the business here to stay and help the community. Um, so we've been doing good. I've been the owner now for two years. And uh, my parents are retired, living in Colombia. So they, they did their part and are enjoying it. Um, and we've been growing, thankfully. It's still been a process. 2020 with COVID was really hard. Um, but we got through it and 2021 was really good. One of the things I would love for you to share is that a situation or story that has resonated with you um, the most when it comes to operating your business and serving others. I mean, you do a really good job at serving others, obviously, but it obviously is um, apparent within your business as well. So what's a situation or story that resonates most with you? Oh, I mean, it's so tough. Uh, countless clients but just going above and beyond when we can and and trying to um if i had to think of one right on spot i really don't know maybe it'll come up come to me in the future but right now i just can't think of one single thing hey we on this podcast it's not scripted and we are trying to get (laughs) the most authentic so if we get if we stump people on some questions we're almost doing it we're doing good here you know so um it's a tough one but uh what about biggest challenge you face currently within your area of expertise and in your industry um you know i think it's just a lot of people doing it for the money uh uh, a lot of people get into business because um anything they see it's good they see people are making profit of it and they just start getting into it they start discounting prices and it's not good for business so the idea with a a cleaning company is to service the community it's not to obviously that you've got to make a profit obviously it's a business but you've got to have service above all and um i mean for me cleaning really is important my dad with the cleaning my mom was a cleaner as well um they were both really organized and uh, I grew up in a really organized home and really I learned that outer order really does lead to inner calm. Like I feel through a clean environment, we just have so much 
uh, more to give out to the world. So um, it's not just cleaning and that's it. No, it's it's actually something that really helps you personally. Mm-hmm. Now, how does cleaning, because a lot of the times cleaning products are bad for the environment. So with you being so passionate about the environment and the animals and everything like that, and we'll talk about your hobbies too, but, um, but like how, how have you overcome that? Because they're kind of, they kind of contradict, right? Or, or what's, what's going on there? Totally, totally. It's like an inner dilemma <laughs> Yeah. Uh, where you see one part of me really wants to do something good for the service and community. And the other wants to do something really good for uh, the environment. And you'll realize they're not always hand in hand. Um, that, I would say, is actually one of the bigger challenges in the industry. Uh, there are a lot of clean products that we try to use and uh, try to make sure there's no chemical residues left over or harming. But, um, but I feel there's a lot of lack of innovation. It's not a place where engineers, creatives get into and say, like, let's make this better. No, it's been the same for many years and i think that's bad for any type of business we should always be innovating trying to be better trying to grow and i think there's still a lot of uh area to grow there yeah maybe that will be your next uh journey then yeah. uh, developing and uh you know coming up with a product line or whatever it might be that's a hundred percent eco-friendly but also does the job because you know i've got suckered into the the eco-friendly stuff Mm -hmm. and i purchase it and usually you're spending more on it and then it doesn't do the trick you know and that's the problem is it's like it's not the same like i'm you know i'm going to go back to what works right um versus one that um i kind of fell into the trap so exactly exactly and a lot and that's a lot of uh well, right now we call it greenwashing, which is marketing through green methods. Mm-hmm. But it's um, finding a good, sustainable company. There's nothing like it. So mm-hmm. so I think that's uh, something we should all aspire to. Yeah. Well, I hinted at it. Well, let's talk about your hobbies. All right. I have to admit, you and I already know being a triathlete and doing triathlons, um, that's intense. W- what... What inspired you to get to become a, a triathlon um, competitor? Oh, it's since I was young. Um, in high school, I got into triathlons. My junior year, I was uh, a runner for, I think, eighth grade, from eighth grade. Um, I was actually a really fat kid when I was young. And when I started running and getting fit, there was just nothing like it. I still miss... Uh, maybe being in the shape I once was because I was in high school. I remember I was training six hours a day. Wow. And it something about triathlon, it's just your muscles can't adapt to it. You're doing three different things and going from one sport to the next at that same intensity. It's just like your body has to adapt. You have to get quick, everything. So it's, it's a lot to do. That's interesting. So um, now how many have you done? Are you looking to do one right now? Where are you at? So I'm trying to do one in Ocala in April, April 2nd. Okay. Um, I haven't done one since 2018. I just started training again pretty much end of last year. Uh, 2018, I did a half Ironman in Panama City up in Florida. Wow. Wow. Um, I know that one's not no joke. I've looked into that one. That, yeah. Oh, and can it, you can you give the listeners what a what what an Iron Man would be, um, and then you know put so, in context. So I did a half Iron Man. So everything I'm about to say is double. So I did a uh, 1.2 mile swim. So a full is 2.4. <laughs> I did a 56 mile bike. So a full would be 112. And then I did a half marathon, and uh, it would be a full marathon for the full Iron Man. That's intense. Uh, just world records, like around eight hours. So it's a full day for, for a full for, Iron for Man. For a full Iron Man. Eight hours. <laughs> like you're. And they have a 17 hour cap. And people get right in there at 1658, 1659. Wow. That's insane. That first of all, for like, I'm getting goosebumps. I'm thinking about <laughs> eight hours that you're, you're operating at 110%. You know, you're operating at peak performance for that long. I don't understand. So oh. that's insane. It, it's awesome. Um, I took five hours for the half Ironman. It was great. Um, 
it, I can't say it was perfect. Uh, while I was swimming, I got stung by a jellyfish. While I was on the bike, I got stung by a bee. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it was just hectic, hectic. Had shoe problems on the run, oh, but I loved every minute of it. But two weeks where I was just in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the recovery was oh. pretty intense. I remember the only experience I have of um, my parents did them a long time ago before I was um, uh, even born. But um, I remember I had a teacher that did it one time and came into school on Monday, like did a regular marathon. And I remember that teacher like just couldn't get out of their chair. And I was just like, is it that bad? You know, and then I now obviously knowing more that I um, in the experience I have, I'm like, oh, yeah, that would be that would be brutal. Oh, brutal. It's, it's something your body can't even like analyze. You're just you have to be in bed. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, one other hobby I know you have is horseback riding. Is that correct? Yep. So yeah. like I said, we love nature. We love animals. And uh, I've always had horses um, since I was 10 months old. My dad had me riding 10 hours uh, in one day. And uh, right now, my dad and I once in a while will go out and do three, four, five day horseback rides. It's usually eight hours a day going from town to town in Columbia uh, through mountains. Uh, one of my uncles just knows his way through the mountains, but it is an experience like you have to do. It's wow. It's gorgeous. You're just enjoying it, looking mm -hmm. at everything, but you're also in really dangerous situations where you're looking at cliffs, you're on a horse, you, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You gotta so. trust that horse. Yep. You're in connection and uh -huh. instinct. So, well, amazing. Um, we're going to get to our newer segment of the RP experience, and that's uh, our three questions that every guest gets the opportunity to answer. Um, that first question is How has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for a later success? Um, in regards to that, do you have a favorite failure of yours? Oh, let's see. Uh, I think failure is the key to anything, but um, you've got to, you've got to try everything. But right now, I'd say for me initially, the blueberry farm was going to be oh, it's it was a pure financial project, and when I started turning into that, I guess you could say my financial project for it failed, but it just helped me realize there was so much uh, other things to do, um, and so much to see that I, I learned how to manage my personal bit so like jo i learned how to manage that much better through through the blueberry a uh, farm and then i also learned to turn the blueberry farm into what it is mm -hmm. um so I, I would say initially it turned out as a failure and now it's i love it that's <laughs> so cool the second one is when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused uh or you've lost that focus temporarily what do you do how do you overcome it oh it's tough i, th I think it's all about discipline um, I try to get up at 5 a.m. every day. Um, I've read the 5 a.m. club, and I try to do quite a bit of stuff from there. Um, but I think my main thing is just take a breather. I'll go read a book. One day I'll just not touch my phone. Um, go travel to Columbia for a week or two, and that just recharges me. I think just getting away from everything for a little bit, it allows you to see everything clearer. But I think it's just building that discipline so where everything becomes easy. And putting yourself in um, difficult situations really helps. Mm -hmm. So s whenever there's something I don't want to do, pushing through it every time is just much easier. So Agreed. Agreed. Uh, what are bad recommendations or advice you hear within your industry? So... Obviously, maybe the, the green wash that you had talked about could be a negative one. But what are some very apparent things that you hear within your industry? So I think that's that's uh, one. But um, I think it's just doing it for the for the money. Like everyone's l focused on the money and not the actual service. So a lot of people will say like, oh, we just don't tell our clients. That's not I'm like I believe you've got to be straightforward. You've got to be honest. Um, and if people want to buy from you when you're honest, then you're actually selling something. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one, just being honest and make sure to always tell your clients what you're, what they're getting. And I think that one applies the most across the whole board, right? Yep. That's any business or any really person. Right. Um, and so that's, that's powerful. So, well, 
Santiago, we are already out of time. It's been amazing to have you on here. Thank you again for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Well, time flew, honestly. I was shorter than I expected. Right? Amazing. Loved it. Thank you for the experience, and thank you for having me out here. Uh, of course. So, as always, RP Experience is extremely thrilled to have you on here. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned to the next episode. We're here at VentureX, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.